Hi, this is Chris Young. Welcome to episode 76 of Contemplating Life. This week we continue reminiscing about my first and only full-time job as a computer programmer. I worked in the IU Department of Medical Genetics along with my college mentor, Dr. John Gerstein. I don't recall what hourly rate I was paid when I went full-time at the genetics department, but it was substantially more than I made as a student programmer. I recall that my annual total came to about $11,700 per year, which may not seem like much, but that would be about $56,500 in today's dollars. According to a website I found, that is well above what an entry-level programmer would make in Indianapolis today. I don't have statistics on how it ranked in the late 1970s. There was a common conception that jobs in academia did not pay as well as those in business or industry, and computer programmers were in short supply in those days, so I probably could have earned much more elsewhere. But I really liked the job. I liked working with Gerstein, even though he was just a part-time consultant on the project, and it was very convenient for me. As I mentioned previously, I drive to work each day with my dad. I'd arrive around 8.30, and most people in the department began work at 9. I would leave each day at 4.30, while most others stayed until 5. The bosses were quite understanding. The schedule worked out well for me and my dad. As I had predicted, limiting my work to just 40 hours per week was a great relief compared to the frantic schedule of being a full-time college student. The only challenge was it was quite tough to get up that early. Mom would get me dressed every morning while Dad was getting ready for work. Often it felt like I slept through it. I used to joke, sometimes I wake up in the lobby of Riley Hospital and don't have any idea how I got there. I have to wake up to drive to the elevator, go down the basement, and go to my office. Our department had its own mini-computer, a digital equipment corporation, PDP-1170. The term mini-computer was relative to the huge mainframe computers of the day. This mini-computer had significantly less computing power than today's desktop PCs, which are called microcomputers. The PDP-1170 was a 16-bit computer. Today's PCs are 64 bits. The minimum configuration of a PDP-11 had only 4K of memory, although the 1170 was expandable to 4 megabytes. I don't really know how much memory our computer had. By size comparison, it was huge. It sat in a row of four cabinets, about two and a half feet square, about six feet tall. The front panel had lots of blinking lights and toggle switches. See the YouTube version of this podcast for photos of similar machines. One of the cabinets contained a 12-inch tape drive that we used to back up our data from the hard drives. In the center of the room sat two large cabinets, slightly smaller than a washing machine. These were our RM05 hard disk drives. A removable stack of 12 disk platters that were 14 inches in diameter was inserted into the drive. Only 19 of the 24 surfaces of these platters were used for writing data. The others were protective platters or contained information that helped position the read-write heads and index the sectors and tracks of the disk platters. Each of these two drives held only 256 megabytes. Your smartphone has at least 32 gigabytes or eight times as much storage. My desktop has several drives that can hold one terabyte, 
which would be 8,000 times more than these washing machine sized cabinets. Periodically, we would back up the entire system. You would take the system offline, put a backup platter stack into one of the drives, and copy the other drive in its entirety. Then you would remove both of those and copy the second drive to a backup drive. We had two printers connected to the machine. One was a traditional dot matrix printer, and the other was something that looked like a laser printer, but it used a special chemically treated paper. I have no idea how it worked. We had four CRT terminals and a deck writer teletype machine connected by serial cables. The computer room had its own air conditioning unit, but it wasn't like we had to use clean room protocols in the area. We could come and grow as we pleased. I remember the air conditioning was quite noisy. As I mentioned, we were in the basement of the hospital. Next to the computer, they had drilled a hole in the concrete floor and driven into it a copper stake, about three quarters of an inch in diameter. Connected to the stake was a large braided copper cable that grounded the computer. About once a week, someone had to take a watering can and pour water around the ground stake so that it would make good contact with the earth. On occasion, we would forget to do so, and the computer would start acting crazy. We would wire the ground stake, reboot the computer, and it would work fine. Now, I told you about the other student programmers who worked with me that one summer, but I've not told you about the three other full-time programmers who worked while I was there. The full-time programmers worked in three offices adjacent to the computer room, while the student programmers and I worked in an office across the hall. Adjacent to the room I worked in was a genetics lab. Apparently, they used mildly radioactive reagents in some of their lab work. So there was a sticker on the door with a radiation symbol and a warning that read, Radioactive Materials Used Inside. Someone had written below that the words, Pre-Faded Genes Only, G-E-N-E-S. A little genetics humor there. Unfortunately, I don't remember all the other programmers' names. There was a guy who had a real common name, like Joe or Steve or something like that. He was a talented programmer who managed to get the graphics family tree program working to a certain extent. He was a nice enough guy, but an introvert and not very sociable. I didn't get to know him very well. There was a very outgoing African-American woman named Dale, who was very friendly. I got along really well with her. We joked around a lot. More stories about her in a minute. The third woman, I think her name was Linda, was in her mid-30s, maybe 40 tops. Divorced, I believe she had a kid or two. She had a grumpy attitude most of the time, but occasionally she would come in Monday morning with a large smile and a cheerful attitude. We learned that on these occasions, she had spent the weekend sleeping with her ex-husband, even though they had been divorced for several years. This seemed to drive Dale crazy, because her relationship with her ex was nothing like that. It was funny to watch Dale rant and rave about the situation. Dale was a devout religious woman. She taught Sunday school in her church. I don't know what Protestant denomination she belonged to. But one day she was struggling with her lesson plan. I believe it was for kindergarten or first grade children. She said, the scripture reading this week is from the book of Revelation where it says that in the end times, the sun will go black and the moon will turn to blood. 
She knew I taught scripture classes at my church, and she wanted my advice on how to teach young children about the end times. What do I do, she asked. Have them draw a picture of a night sky and color the moon red? I asked her, why do you want to teach the end of the world to a bunch of five or six-year-olds? Isn't it better just to say that someday Jesus will return and there will be signs that we can see when he's coming back? Tell them to look at the leaves in the fall, which is a sign that winter is coming. We tell them to look at the flowers and the grass in the spring, which is a sign that summer is coming. We don't know exactly what kinds of signs we'll see when Jesus returns, but they'll be there. You can't get caught up in the details. Find the message behind the scripture. I then tried to explain to her that the prophecies of Revelation were symbolic. When it says that the sun will turn black and the moon will turn red, it's just talking about solar and lunar eclipses. Naturally, during a solar eclipse, the sun goes black. And during a lunar eclipse, the earth casts a shadow on the moon, and the scattering of sunlight through the earth's atmosphere gives the moon a red tinge. She protested, but it doesn't say it's going to be an eclipse. It says the moon will turn to blood. I said, uh, just so I understand, you really believe that at the end of the world, the moon is going to suddenly transform from a giant rock into a huge drop of human blood? Of course not, she replied. It doesn't say human blood. It just says blood. Sorry, Dale. You're on your own on this one, I said. I mentioned that when I first tried to inquire about the job, Dr. Keneally was in a weekly staff meeting with Dr. Gersting and others. Although I didn't attend those meetings as a student programmer, I did attend once I was working there full time. We met in the conference room on the ground floor. The programming staff, including Gersting, sat on one side of the table and the genetics staff, including department chairman Dr. Merritt, who had interviewed me, sat on the other side. Because it's difficult for me to turn my head side to side, I generally sat at the head or foot of the table so that I could look slightly to the left or right and make eye contact with either side of the table. The programming staff had a difficult time explaining to the geneticists what was going on and what challenges we were facing to get the software up and running. Similarly, the MDs on the other side of the table had trouble expressing themselves in language that the programmers could understand. Of course, I understood the programming issues pretty well. And having lived my life with a genetic disease, I also knew enough about genetics to follow along, even if I was no expert. So I sat there with the PhDs on either side of me who could not communicate with one another because they were so stuck in their own jargon they couldn't speak plain English. Often I found myself instantly saying something like, so what you're saying, Dr. Gersey, is, and then I would repeat the same thing he just said in plain English. And occasionally, I had to reinterpret what the genetics people were saying in plain English. The response generally was, why didn't you just say that? That's what I wanted to know. Why can't you speak plain English? It was frustrating to me that I was surrounded by highly educated people with poor communication skills. After these Friday staff meetings, Gersting and the computer staff would return to our dungeon offices. Gersting would sit back in his chair and say, I don't know if we accomplished anything today, 
but the quality of the debate was much improved. I've been using that sentence for decades, especially during some of those contentious finance committee and parish council meetings I had at St. Gabriel during my years of ministry there. Sometimes success is measured in such tiny increments that simply getting your point across can be considered a victory. I'd like to think that in my two years in working at the genetics department, I contributed to improving the quality of the debate. In our next episode, we'll discuss my remaining work at the department and the circumstances under which I eventually left for health reasons. If you find this podcast educational, entertaining, enlightening, or even inspiring, consider sponsoring me on Patreon for just $5 per month. You'll get early access to the podcast and other exclusive content. Although I have some financial struggles, I'm not really in this for the money, but every little bit helps. As always, my deepest thanks to my financial supporters. That support means more to me than words can express. Even if you cannot provide financial support, please post links and share this podcast on social media so I can grow my audience. I just want more people to be able to hear my stories. All my back episodes are available, so check those out. If you have any comments, questions, or other feedback, feel free to comment on any of the platforms where you found the podcast. I'll see you next time as we continue contemplating life. Until then, fly safe, everyone.